Okay, this is our third panel for the day, Aligning Preservation Goals. And we're very fortunate to have as our moderator, the Honorable Gail Brewer, who's been very supportive of preservation and community-based uh, uh, consultation and engagement. So we're, we're really pleased to have you with us, Gail. And she will introduce the other panel members. Yeah, I said this one's on. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, John. Um, I am honored to uh, start this panel. I think we're still waiting for one more uh, panelist, but we're going to get started. Um, I, this panel is basically aligning preservation goals, and it says that the preservation objectives of the public should harmonize with the missions of all government agencies. Good luck as well as related organizations in conservation and housing. If this alignment works, it creates a unified strategy to protect and uphold our cultural and historic treasures. I certainly support that idea. But is it realistic for everyone to adopt a shared framework and process where the key difference lies primarily in resource availability, i.e. funding? So uh, this is a really complicated, excellent topic to be discussing today. So we're going to start with Valerie White, who's the Senior Executive Director at LISC. There, each person will just say for a couple of minutes what they do and maybe how they're related to this topic. And then we have Peg Green, who's the President of New York Landmarks Conservancy, and Olivia Brazy, who is with Coordinator of Technical Services at the New York State Historic Preservation Office. So Valerie, just start for a few minutes. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Great to, great to see you here in wonderful uh, West Harlem. Again, my name is Valerie White. I'm Senior Executive Director of LISC, uh, New York State. LISC is a national nonprofit, the Local Initiative Support Corporation. We started about 40 years ago right here in the South Bronx bringing capital to traditionally disinvested, underserved communities to rebuild community real estate housing, but to involve the community in those decisions. Um, part of the work that I do across the state of New York includes the raising and deployment and investment of capital for underserved communities and uh, disinvested uh, projects. So the whole concept of preservation is something that's very important to our platform. We stand on a basis of equity um, to ensure that those who do not have access to capital, access to housing, access to community services, that, we're in, that frames our investment um, portfolio. So that's what I do. Peg Green. Hi, I'm Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Uh, we're a 51-year-old uh, preservation organization, and uh, we certainly advocate for preservation, which I'll get to in a moment, but we also have financial and technical programs to actually help people fix their buildings. And through the years, we've loaned and granted probably $63 million to homeowners in low and moderate communities, um, to small businesses, um, to uh, nonprofits, and to landmark religious institutions all across New York State. We've also been involved in long-term projects from the day the Conservancy was uh, created. And currently we're working, uh, we're doing a lot in Staten Island actually, and we're working on uh, restoring Frederick Law Olmsted's home on Staten Island. The basement goes back to the late 1600s and it's where his landscape architecture began. Uh, we're also working with Sandy Ground Historical Society. Sandy Ground is an early free black settlement in southern Staten Island, and um, they're, the building that houses their records uh, needs a lot of work, and um, we're working to help them get, get back in business. And on advocacy, um, we have been opposed from the start. Um, the state plan to level six blocks around Penn Station for what was initially going to be giant towers larger than Hudson Yards. And um, that plan is still on the table. And we're working, uh, we supported a lawsuit against it. We lost the lawsuit initially, but we're coming back. Uh, and we think that um, urban renewal went out a long time ago. And that um, if they just give us the world-class Penn Station they talk about, 
uh, that the area would evolve naturally and you could still save wonderful things like the original powerhouse that McKim, Mead and White built and the beautiful Napoleon Lebrun St. John's Church. Um, there are many issues, but that's it. That's the synopsis. Olivia Brazy from the state. Good afternoon, everyone. You can hear me all right, yes? I'm um, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Franson and HDC. Um, very honored to be among an esteemed uh, group of colleagues. And I will thank Kathy Howe for um, her comments in our second panel, my colleague Kathy, um, and also for giving you an idea of what we do at SHPO. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my own um, story and what I do at SHPO. Um, I did review the um, Penn Center or Penn Civics Area's uh, you know, improvement plan, um, for better or worse. I was involved in that review, so I've been involved in um, some of the um, bigger projects that have been mentioned here um, today, again, for better or worse. Um, <laughs> So at SHPO, I'm the Technical uh, Services Unit Coordinator, uh, meaning basically I help our office administer the State Historic Preservation Act and the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106. Um, and what I um, do is really, or what I, the value of my work and what I get satisfaction out of is ensuring that you know, we're following um, the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law. Um, and I do interface with um, advocacy groups, but also other state and federal agencies and um, various members of the public. And I get the most enjoyment out of, um, you know, talking about the preservation laws we have and how they work and really what the purpose of these laws are, which is to save the places that we care about. Um, so I, I did, um, prior to coming to SHPO, I worked at the Landmarks Commission in New York City. And so I I'm so pleased to be you know, back in New York City where I started my career and my years at the Landmarks Commission were um, you know, incredibly enjoyable and, and educational. Um, and I see a lot of colleagues in the room and a lot of former professors. So I will just say I'm very grateful to be here. And um, thank you to everyone for showing up because we all care. So thank you. Thank you. One of the conundrums is, of course, um, you're in a preservation area. And how do you also build affordable housing? So my question to starting with you at LISC, Lowry, is can preservation and affordable housing work together, perhaps through an increase in historic tax credits, or are there other ways that LISC has managed to uh, figure out a way to do both, if you have? I think this is the question, because so many groups don't have the funding to be able to do what would be a uh, appropriate affordable housing in a landmark historic area, and I do get frustrated by people stating it's not possible because damn right, we need to make it possible. Go ahead, Val. Yeah, so um, I will say it's quite difficult, and the reason why it's difficult is because we're talking about building housing that's affordable, um, and it's the most complex uh, structure, the most complex finance in all of the housing housing finance world. I have been doing housing finance for blah, blah, blah years, <laughs> well over 35. I, yeah, well, yeah, so now you all know how old I am. But, um, you know, when tax credits were started and, and, the, and you know, the, uh, everything like that. But as I've been doing this work, both in government, in the private sector, um, and then in the nonprofit, I know that this is the most complex, and what troubles me as a housing professional is why is the most expensive, most, most complex transaction needed to house the most vulnerable, right? And so that's probably the reason why we're having this conversation, because the resources are just simply not there. We have been able at LISC, and um, you know, again, we don't have enough resource to cover and um, you know, just take care of the entire problem, but we are able to contribute through our uh, financing products. We uh, provide uh, on the short term, the front end of the construction uh, financing, um, and that is through uh, lending for acquisition or pre-development. We uh, have grant opportunities for um, faith-based organizations that are doing affordable housing on existing land that they already have, many of which are in preservation areas like the one that we're discussing. And we provide that funding for the pre-development um, part of the transaction. And then we might come in with some bridge financing or other type of financing to help that project go forward. 
Um, and we do that uh, across the U.S. Uh, some of the active pro projects that we've had here in New York um, include affordable housing, but also affordable home own ownership, limited equity uh, properties, uh, many of them right here in Harlem. One just on, I want to say, 110 Lakes Avenue that we just closed on not too long ago. And um, we think it's important to look at the array of different types of housing affordability um, for the community to ensure that folks who live in the community are a, uh, afford to stay there, but also have the benefits of not just rental, but um, you know, home ownership as well. So um, that is basically some of the type of projects that we've done. Uh, last year, we did a total of $77 million of investment in affordable housing uh, across the state. I would say the bulk of that was down here in the city, about uh, $68 million of that. And it was in a variety of projects. And it sounds like a little bit, but it's a lot of loans of 200000 to close the bridge, 300000 if uh, historic tax credits are available and bridge financing is uh, needed for that uh, developer, whether it's a nonprofit developer or a developer of color, both are the ones that we work with, um, as well as other developers too, so long as the project is affordable. But we're looking to see how can we contribute and invest in um, properties and housing that's going to close that gap of access for those who the are the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. So Peg, the issue of course is sometimes the religious institutions, um, you've done an amazing work at Landmarks Conservancy trying to work with some of them. Many of them are either, as we heard earlier, landmark or have land near them. So the question is, how do you build housing? How do you keep the structure that's landmarked? And um, how do you finance it? And at the same time, how do you make sure that people in the neighborhood understand the importance of doing all of that? So I didn't know if you want to talk a little bit because it's, you know, here is where preservationists, I think, can build housing if it's done with some of the funding that uh, Valerie's talking about. Well, of course, one of the reasons that we can't build affordable housing is that the federal government has stopped um, assisting developers of affordable housing. Um, the land price in New York is extremely high. A lot of affordable housing developers have been looking in outer boroughs. Uh, Manhattan is off the charts. Um, most real estate developers don't want to build affordable housing. You know, look at Brooklyn, look at parts of Queens. Entire cities have grown up in the past few years. I barely recognize places when I go through them anymore. But they're not affordable housing. It's because it's market rate. And we've also reached a point in the city under the last couple of administrations that the answer to everything is let a developer build more and build higher and we can get a school or we can get an affordable uh, housing development. And um, until we kind of break that cycle, I think it's going to be extremely difficult. There was an article in the Times a few weeks ago um, and a firm called PAU, um, Pres the Preservation of Architecture and Urbanism, um, did a study. Everybody's been running around looking for vacant lots. Here's a vacant lot. We can build something here. They did it with the notion that they were going to, no historic district was going to be damaged in, the, in uh, completing this project. And they showed um, sites throughout the city that could have maybe 500,000 units ultimately, but it would be geared to um, the heights of the neighborhoods. So if there were, if you were, if you were turning a parking lot into affordable housing, you could match the, the tall buildings around you. If you were looking in a residential neighborhood, they would look at, you know, the, the tallest building around within a certain radius and you wouldn't exceed that. Um, there's a lot that would have to be done to make that ha happen. And one of the things that would have to be done is to really challenge elected officials. I think we're in a time when it's going to be housing at all costs, housing no matter the costs. And um, there's a way to create housing that doesn't destroy the neighborhoods that people have cared about for years and that are not just historic districts, but livable neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, and I think we have to uh, really make the case uh, for why neighborhood character matters. Um, and there is a case to be made. Um, 
we have tried for a long time to get religious institutions to look at their schools, their parish houses, their vacant lots, and um, see if they couldn't be transformed into you know, affordable units, senior centers, or whatever. Um, again, it's, it's cost, and are there developers out there who want to build these, these smaller lever buildings? And um, there's now, in this, uh, the city of Yes, we, we just heard that um, there's going to be a way to expand where uh, landmark religious institutions can land air rights. Um, we have tried to work on that for years. The religious institutions have come to us time and again. And there was a whole project once that they could land bank the air rights. You could sell them within, if your, if your church or synagogue was within an historic district, you could sell air rights to this land bank and then they would redistribute them later. Uh, very hard to do um, constitutionally in the city. And there was the whole question of where are they going to land and how happy were they were landing. So it's, it's a very complicated topic. Um, I think that one of the best things preservation does is try to keep people in the housing that they have now. Um, we're having our Moses Awards uh, next month. And, uh, and it, a total wreck of a police, former police precinct in Brooklyn is now going to be a men's shelter. Um, there are there are ways to do it if you have if you have the will, um, but neighborhood character matters because we all it's, we have to be a livable city, and we have to be in New York that is recognizable. There are Shanghai's, there are other, you know, cities that rely solely on on taller buildings. I don't, I'm not sure we that's how we want to live. That's a question for all of us, um, but there can be harmony between new development and preservation, but we really have to keep making that case. Thank you, that's what I have to do with City Hall, but sometimes I'm all by myself, so it's very nice to hear Peg Breen say that. Um, Olivia, can you, I mean, obviously you have uh, experience at LPC as well as at the state, so my question is, what are some ideas that you might have about how to answer this question of the preservation and the historic, and, and the housing. housing? Housing, yeah, thank you, that's a good question. Um, so, um, in my uh, role, I look at projects statewide. Um, so I can say that from the sort of New York statewide perspective, um, I know that the goals of preservation and affordable housing are not always diametrically opposed. Um, from my own experience uh, working on reviewing New York City projects for affordable housing, I can say that unfortunately that usually means demolition of a church or a, you know, synagogue or um, an institutional building. Um, for construction of new housing, and I have, you know, understood that you know the the economics of it are so um, challenging in New York City. Um, it's almost always well, you know, we can't uh, this existing convent can't yield the number of units that is required for our program, um, you know, in order to qualify for low income housing tax credits or uh, whatever other you know um, funding sources may be coming from you know the federal or the state um, side and. I, so my role in that is, um, at the end of the day, um, you know, the affordable housing gets built, but we at least um, acknowledge the historic building. Um, we uh, basically make sure that uh, the adaptive reuse was actually seriously considered, um, and you know, we then end up with documentation of the historic building. Um, so for so that's a kind of um, reality of the laws we have and the economics, if, from my perspective, of, of how tough it is in the housing market in New York City. Um, the tax credit program is really um, huge. And that's if you can explain that more for people, I think. Sure, yeah. So the Federal uh, Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program um, provides a 20% federal income tax credit for commercial properties. Um, and uh, there is a state credit, uh, an additional 20% state credit, basically uh, rehabbing existing historic buildings that are listed in the National Register or getting listed in the National Register um, for um, you know, a new use or the same use. Um, housing is big. Um, industrial buildings lend themselves really well to house conversion for housing. And, and I've, I've worked on an, a, a handful of successful um, conversions of industrial buildings for um, low income and supportive housing, one in the Bronx. Um, uh, another project uh, I would like to talk about a little bit is the uh, former Greenpoint Hospital um, in Greenpoint, uh, <laughs> Brooklyn. Um, 
the uh, original nurses' residence, um, a pretty small scale historic building, um, is being converted to supportive housing. Um, and that uh, original uh, hospital campus, and it's eligible for listing in the National Register, uh, they didn't go for historic tax credits. Um, but uh, obviously they're getting some federal funding, um, so that's why we ended up getting involved in the review. Um, the original campus was quite small. Um, they're doing a good amount of new construction on the campus, um, but adaptively reusing the nurse's residence. So, um, but back to the, the tax credit program, um, the big deal and what I'd like to highlight um, recently that our office has been involved in is uh, New York City Housing Authority's um, tax credit applications. So they, uh, NYCHA, has been um, actively identifying their historic housing complexes and um, working to list them in the National Register so that they can um, partner with private developers to make the historic tax credit part of their financing package to fund the rehabilitation of their buildings. Um, and that's been a really um, close partnership between our office and NYCHA and the National Park Service um, and the third party developers um, that's been I think um, a really, really, it demonstrates uh, you know, how important the tax credit financing is. And I've heard from other tax credit applicants that, um, that the, the historic tax credit piece of the financing is even more important after the, <laughs> since the pandemic. Um, that the, it's just, and that's wonderful because we want more people to look at historic buildings and see not an obstacle, but a potential. And that's really what the tax credit program does. So. I could just add, Gail, that, that uh, you can only get that tax credit in certain census tracts, and a lot of our loans are in those tracts. So if we are doing a building, the other cost is it, it costs so much more now. The cost of materials has gone. You can't, it, it, it's astronomical. Um, but we have helped, I think, at least 15 or 16 homeowners now get several hundred thousand dollars off their, off their taxes because we will do the applications for them and help them process it and make sure that they, they do get the tax credit. Val, if you want to talk a little bit about maybe, uh, this NYCHA thing is interesting. I had, and Harlem is full of great, great uh, NYCHA developments um, who, that have been there in some cases for a long time. So that's something that I'd love to hear more about. But maybe you could talk a little bit, Valerie, about how you use the tax credits and Again, because I know you have a broader perspective than just preservation areas, but how you think just if you had all the resources you needed, um, how you might go about trying to think more about preservation and housing. Again, resources is the bottom line. So um, as we, we are an investor, an, an in intermediary investor, we're a community development financial institution, CDFI. So we bring the, the capital to the project. Um, so at LIST, we work with the developer, whether it is a, a nonprofit developer or I said a private developer, generally a developer um, who doesn't necessarily have the same access to capital from a traditional bank. Because again, equity is uh, the uh, forefront of our um, investment. But we also, we have a specific program actually for faith-based institutions called the New York Land Opportunity Program. And as I described before, we um, work with uh, the faith-based institutions that have the existing land or property that look to convert it into housing. So we help um, provide that gap of funding in uh, what we call the capital stack or the array of different type of funding that's needed to do one project. And so, um, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Peg. As Peg said earlier, it's very expensive, so you have to sort of pick all of these different sources. It might be a government grant from the Community Development Block Grant. It might be partial loan from uh, HPD or HCR. Uh, PEG may provide some lending or grants in there. And then you, you still might have, uh, developers still might have a gap. Where we come in is to close that gap. So with the historic tax credits that were described, that's a source of capital that will be going into the transaction. In most cases with tax credits, they um, come at the end of the, the, uh, the second phase of the transaction. So the, the construction has to be done for the tax credits to get to the, to the um, project. So what we do is provide the gap funding or what we call a bridge financing so that once the construction happens and it closes and it moves into permanent financing, um, my uh, organization is paid back 
with the uh, tax credit income. So that's where we come in, in on that regard. But a little bit more broadly, uh, we do see faith-based institutions as an opportunity, those that have land and site control, um, to um, add to the portfolio of affordable housing. So we've done um, two cohorts, uh, one here in New York City of three churches, uh, another one of seven churches uh, across the um, across the state. Uh, not only do we provide the funding, we help the organization through the process because one of the things that happens sometimes with faith-based institutions when they get into development, they may not necessarily end up at the end with what they think they sh were going to get, right, when they got into the project. So what we do at LISC is that we stay with them. We have a source of, uh, of consultants that we source to help architects, um, engineers, um, you know, those that do the environmental studies, lawyers, to ensure that the structure that the church is looking for uh, is what they get at the end. And that would include housing, uh, potentially some income back to the church or its nonprofit when it's done. So that is a potential opportunity um, for increasing housing, but there are circumstances where it, there may be other ways to, um, you know, to get to that point. Uh, with a faith-based institution, um, and that is some of the work I think that you're doing. Yeah. The reason I bring this up is having been borough president, I think I know every blade of grass in the borough of Manhattan, and we don't have a lot of blades of grass. We don't have a lot of open space. Other boroughs may have more. So to me, um, it is often the faith-based that have the land and the interest in doing, and in our situation, preservation. So that's why I keep focused on this. NYCHA is another place, but I feel very strongly that the campuses that NYCHA is on should not be destroyed. When you're in a small apartment, you need that open space, you need to have the trees and so on, and some of them have gorgeous open spaces. So the question is, okay, so where's the parking lot at NYCHA, and then we can put the cars underneath and not destroy the open space and give some of this opportunity that we're just discussing today. So Peg, back to you, just again, trying to think as you have so often, are there other ways in the borough of Manhattan that we should be thinking about preservation and housing? Even just finding an empty lot in the borough of Manhattan is challenging. If there was one in a preservation area, I think everyone would be open to trying to come up with some of these ideas. But I'm just, I'm stretching the uh, ideas as far as I can because this borough is tough. It's the most expensive, it's the densest, and it has the least amount of open land. So um, I'm going back to you, Peg, to see if there are any other places you think that this group, I hope that in the community boards or in your civic life, literally if you see something that could be developed, with all due respect to you know, City of Yes, and I'm up to here with City of Yes. I can tell you everything I, I can tell you everything about City of Yes. Um, when we get to the housing, as soon as we're done with economic development, then we do need to think about what this room is discussing today. So, Peg, go ahead. Any I other I, ideas? I wish I had some great answers, but, you know, we, we've been through MIH, where um, the city's already said in certain places, if you, you know, if we'll let you build above the zoning if you put in affordable units. I don't think anybody's been satisfied that that's been a success. Um, and um, so I don't know how you build your way out of this. Um, clearly, and Livia would know this, at Landmarks, they are constantly allowing new development and new buildings in historic districts. Um, and Mark Levine, actually the current borough president, has, has come up with a, a lot of sites too. But I go back to the, I go back to the financing I go back to the fact that particularly in Manhattan, developers want to build in Manhattan not to give you affordable housing, but to give themselves more market rate housing. And I'm not sure how you change that culture. And um, once again, um, the real estate people were against preservation from the beginning. And it's amazing to me that they're almost using the same arguments sometime, that we are once again freezing the city in amber. And I want to say, you need to get out more because just, you know, look up. <laughs> you know? Um, so I think you really need to aim at the LISCs of the world and the low-income housing developers of the world if you want 
um, new buildings in neighborhoods that don't wreck the character of those buildings. Um, and I don't, have, I don't have the money funding answer for that, but I also think that, um, again, we're at a time where um, I used to be a political reporter, and people love to, uh, lawmakers love to name uh, law, laws. So like, you know, the perfect answer to the housing crisis, A24 is coming out anytime soon. And, um, but it doesn't really resolve it. And I think there's gotta be a huge focus, particularly with the city of yes folks now. And I think it's very hard, no matter how many times they're out there trying to sell the program, um, it's hard unless there are people on the community board or more people in the community who can push back with answers or push back with alternatives. Um, but I think that that's what we need to do now. This is, this is more than New York. There's a national push for housing, housing, housing. And again, we're not against housing. It's how you do it. Um, and I think we're at a, a serious time where preservation is being totally discounted or, or um, impugned as the enemy. And I think we have to, to push back and look for programs that balance, as LISC does, um, new growth and neighborhood character. Uh, can I throw a little bit of a, uh, my personal observation in here? So I, I live in Brooklyn. I know I'm in Manhattan, but I live in Brooklyn in a historic district. Um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Brooklyn. I live on Clinton, Clinton Avenue. Okay, um, between uh, Gates and Green. Okay, beautiful. I know right. where that is. Um, so, if you, if for those of you that are that drive around in that area, the fabric of that neighborhood has changed dramatically. There, there were no high rises uh, when I first moved over there. There's a high rise on Vanderbilt and um, Fulton. There's a high rise on Waverly and Fulton. There's another one going up on Waverly and Atlantic. Then on, uh, and I'm talking about like a four block area. Down on Myrtle Avenue, now there's a high rise going on on Myrtle and Vanderbilt. And the, the corner store on Clinton and Avenue, that whole thing is closed down because they're building housing on top. None of those are affordable housing. And so I see the fabric of my historic neighborhood changing uh, uh, drastically without even bringing affordable housing in it. Directly next to my unit, my um, building, my condo, was a big open space that was the front of the Teen Challenge Center, for, again, for those of you that, that know where I'm talking about. Um, and during COVID, I don't even know how this happened because construction went on every single day during COVID when I was home uh, and I had to listen to it. Now adjacent to me are, I wanna say seven townhouses that look nothing like the rest of the block. Nothing on that block was built after 39. Everything was 39 and prior. And those um, homes went for $4 million each per bedroom. So. If I'm going to have a change in the fabric of my neighborhood, I want to see some equity in terms of access to housing, and that's not what I'm seeing. So I'm assuming this is, these are the type of things that we're talking about seeing across, uh, across in the city. Yeah. I just go up Broadway in the Upper West Side, and you see only, only uh, expensive and ugly to add to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Olivia, uh, statewide, you may have some examples perhaps of what we're trying to accomplish because maybe in other parts that don't have the land prices that we do um, and maybe there's places that you think we should uh, pay attention to. Yeah, so um, in other cities across New York State, um, building codes are not as strict and um, those city leaderships might not be adopting you know, green building laws quite as quickly as New York has um, and those two those two things affect the, viabil the viability of projects um, enormously. Um, I will say, um, somebody mentioned SROs earlier in panel discussion too, and I think um, that New York City seems to be um, understanding that um, some of the um, housing and zoning rules um, that, that are on the books now are a little outdated, and I like the idea of going back to, um, you know, housing kind of styles that um, are actually, you know, represented in our historic buildings, such as SROs. Um, so I think um, changing the zoning to, um, you know, try to tackle some of these tricky economic, you know, problem challenges is important. Um, 
Yeah, you, I don't see New York City changing its building code to be more lax anytime soon <laughs> or to um, uh, you know, create more exemptions for historic buildings. Um, that said, I do think bigger picture, um, the preservation is, I think, converging more and more with the idea of sustainability and like the really big picture sense. And so I, I'm hopeful that um, people are looking at historic buildings um, and again, seeing them not as much as an obstacle, but as an opportunity, uh, even with um, you know, uh, the, the level of retrofit that's required to meet something like local law 97, it's, it's enormous and it actually doesn't meet our current uh, secretary standards. Um, and that those are the federal guidelines for um, best practices and preservation. Um, and I wanna touch on that because I think um, what we're seeing now in the preservation field is an understanding that those standards are a little bit out of date um, <laughs> and there needs to be more flexibility in how we apply those standards. Um, and I think that's gonna be really important going forward um, and is hopefully gonna actually mean something for projects um, you know, to create affordable housing. It's hopefully gonna get a little bit easier to navigate the federal programs that use the standards. Um, I'll mention that the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which is the federal um, body that um, you know, promulgates preservation policy uh, nationwide, issued a policy statement <clears throat> uh, in the last summer or last fall about um, application of the secretary standards for affordable housing projects and basically saying we need to uh, be a lot more flexible than we have in the past, um, in particular with respect to interior historic features. Um, and that having worked in the tax credit program and reviewed um, projects um, for many years, mostly in New York City, but also projects in other um, parts of the state, um, that is you know, one of the hardest things to do is to meet the secretary's standards while also um, you know, achieving the, the you know, sort of whether it's housing goals or you know, office space goals or whatever goals of the project and um, preservation standards. Um, so I, I guess there are other cities like Ithaca, for example, that are leading the way with um, sustainability. So I think that's a city to look at. Um, I believe Kathy might know this. They might also have a local historic commission, but uh, I'll leave it at that because I don't actually have any other examples that come to mind right off the bat. Okay, um, I, why don't we take some audience questions. If there are some, go ahead right there in the green. Yes, uh, what do we do about the landlords that are warehousing unstabilized apartments? I can re repeat the question. I mean, it's not something that we're going to be able to solve today. What about the landlords that are, who are um, warehousing apartments? That's a state issue, I'll be honest with you. Um, if we, only thing we've been able to do, hopefully in the city council, we could, we're passing a law that says, keep tabs, give us the data, because we don't even have that. But in terms of changing it, that has to go to the state. There's nothing that the city can do, to be honest with you. But they are working on it, right? The state is working on it, absolutely. And so I've just, it hasn't happened though. And the red there, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Why do they, why are they charging so much for apartments? I mean, why can't they just lower the rents and make them affordable? They get a lot of more tenants and make a lot more people happy. If they just lowered the rents and, you know, I mean, it, to me, it, it's just pure greed. I, I will tell you that that's a hard question. Obviously, rent stabilization, rent control have certain guidelines. On the market, if there was to be uh, something, there is a bill in Albany, it's very controversial. Um, that is considering that a market rent cannot be, uh, you can't be evicted, and there are, would be certain criteria. So my guess is that that is going to be coupled with whatever 421A or the new version of it. So just so you know, in Albany, again, this is an Albany issue, there is a lot of discussion about trying to couple those two. It's, uh, let's see what happens. You know, and it's not just in, in the New York, it's all over the country. Well, you know? I'm only caring about New York. Yeah. I don't give a, can't oh, yeah. give a damn thing I about just, the rest of the country. I just don't know why everything's so expensive when it wasn't expensive before. I hear you. The gentleman in the gray. Go ahead, sir. Right behind you. Yeah. You know, we have not our, bite. our tax rates are ridiculously high. We all pay personal tax rates. And the cost of keeping up buildings has gone up astronomically, too. So it just everything is more expensive in New York, which is... Part of, part of the problem. Don't feel alone. I am from Clinton Hills. Okay. I've seen you in the neighborhood. Oh, 
I, <laughs> I've been in the neighborhood since the early 90s, so good to see you. That was very special. The woman over there in the orange, yes. Hello, I'm Lynn Funk, an architect, and this is my question after listening to the same sort of theme in the three panels. In discussing how to improve communities like the um, accessory develop, uh, accessory dwelling units, ADUs, and talking about models like Ma Maplewood and um, also Montclair, New Jersey, being good ideas about how to use preservation and restoration to make n neighborhoods better. Who is displaced by these models and what is going to be done in City of Yes and other places when you improve the neighborhood and the, the rents go up and people are pushed out? Well, that's a question for all these City of Yes guys who are going to go around trying to sell it to you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have that answer. But it's for any group that is improving, improving housing and buildings. Well, you know, the, preservation has, has been, it, it's, it's a hard question, but um, there's no doubt that in cases where there have been historic districts that um, values have gone up and some people have moved out. But there's also, here in Harlem and elsewhere, um, people have been able to stay. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not a real estate person, <laughs> I do this. Um, I just want to say though, speaking of Albany, uh, the city is once again trying to raise the FAR cap or eliminate the FAR cap. There was a state cap placed on the size of residential buildings, you know, in the 60s. Floor area ratio. Floor area ratio. And um, the state, starting with uh, Mayor de Blasio, has tried every year to, um, to eliminate the cap. And this would put enormous pressure for large buildings throughout the city. And I heard um, Mark from uh, Landmarks, the attorney at the last thing, saying, well, all these changes don't change us because you know, we can still, uh, we have to look and make a building appropriate. Uh, I think there's going to be enormous pressure on them to um, let inappropriate buildings and much larger buildings be, um, be raised because if the cap is listed and they can say, hey, you know, there's going to be three units of so-called affordable housing here, um, they're going to have a hard time. Um, I think they do a good job now of allowing new buildings in historic districts but, and trying to make them contextual. But I think City of Yes, and I think particularly if the FAR cap goes, they're going to have a terrible time trying to protect historic character. Yes. Go ahead. And then I'll go to the back after you. Go ahead. My question is, you mentioned SRO. Now, I came from California 40 years ago, and there was an SRO at the corner of 81st and Columbus, and all it was was drunks on the streets that I would not walk on. And the most hotel. women. Yeah, so if you're going to change SROs, are you going to change the way SROs are set up or, you know, so that you don't have all these, you know, so horrible, not horrible, but people who are not. So uh, people who need the, the care and attention they're not getting. Yes. Yeah. So that why I think my what I was trying to explain was um, it, for the adaptive reuse of historic buildings, um, a lot of times we, we deal with buildings that were originally constructed as an SRO, and that doesn't meet current code. Uh, but I think my point was the codes need to um, change, and they need to allow for um, more compact living spaces and maybe living spaces that don't have uh, kitchens. Um, and that can be you know, a way that you know, preservation is more flexible and more accessible for you know, projects that are going to use existing buildings. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Let me give you an example. Right now, the migrants, and I'm very supportive of them and work really hard with the families and individuals, are in so many dormitories in the borough of Manhattan that used to be single room occupancy. You'd be surprised at how many. So at some point, the migrants will move to affordable housing or housing, one way or the other. They're not going to, in my opinion, going to be there forever. So here will be an example. We could have 
what I would like, which is, and they're mostly in, often in preservation areas, it's, it's totally in concert with the height of the building. So here would be an example if the city had any sense, he would turn it over to a nonprofit, quality nonprofit, and they would run it as a single room occupancy for the ushers and the dishwashers and the people who need units at affordable rents. There are hundreds of units in this situation. So and let's see if that happens. And that the key is providing the social services that go along with that type of housing. And so, you know, we deal with the building, the, we, we are all about, you know, what's the physical building and how are we preserving it? And, you know, we, um, we don't really get into questions of use um, directly, that is, indirectly. I do. It. Yes, and you do a fantastic job of it. There's a woman in the back and then Barry, go ahead. So currently, I'm going to try to answer that. It's a, a lot of parts to that question, but the question was basically, um, how, can you apply for a federal and state commercial tax credit for historic rehab for um, a rent-stabilized building? And the key there is that that's a rental property. So the uh, owner of that building would need to um, want to apply, apply for the federal tax credit. And the program is, is intended for um, substantial rehabilitation of a building, meaning they have to spend almost the, well, basically like the amount that the building costs, they have to spend that um, in order to qualify for the program. And so in thinking about Manhattan, I mean, it's a rental real estate market. And I think that, you know, the historic tax credit doesn't lend itself well to rental buildings. Um, there's not a lot of, perhaps not a lot of incentive for a building owner to um, spend a boatload of money when they have, um, they would have to raise rent, um, you know, enormously for that to work. Um, the qualifying census tract, um, the way the federal program, and I should say the federal program, it's a 20% federal tax credit, is available um, regardless of census tract, uh, but it's the state credit that's dependent on census tracts, and um, there is an acknowledgement that that should be expanded um, to increase accessibility, and it has been in, in um, a city in various other cities in New York State. I won't get into the weeds there, but it hasn't quite made it to New York City yet. Um, Barry? Barry, did you have a question? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Um, I, you know, someone raised uh, eliminating the 12 FAR cap, and I don't think anyone acknowledges when we talk about it that the only people who could ever take advantage of that are extremely large developers that could put together massive amounts of capital to build a building greater than 12 FAR. My question is to the, like, what can be done to make navigating historic regulations easier for small property owners who want to comply or maybe do an adaptive reuse and do preservation but are just daunted by the immense amount of technical assistance that's sometimes required to do that work and that can feel overwhelming? Our, our loans come with um, beginning to end uh, assistance from my staff to make sure they're using the right contractors and architects, we run interference, we bring it up, make sure it's being done to uh, landmark standards. And the Landmarks Commission, through the years, um, they now allow substitute materials in some cases, so that, uh, which are less expensive. Um, they've gone out of their way to try to streamline the process, and much more is being done, uh, okayed at a, at a staff level. So I think that the preservation community, and particularly the Landmarks Commission, um, have really acknowledged um, cost. And I, I don't think preservation adds as much cost as the Department of Building adds some days, and city taxes do. Um, but they're really trying very hard to um, compromise where they can. And groups like LISC and groups like the Conservancy are working from the beginning to the end to make sure that it's done okay. Question over here in the back. Was there anybody in the back? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Valerie Bradley with Save Harlem Now. She's been my friend for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I just want to let you know that State Senator Cordell Clear has introduced a bill which uh, is called uh, the Social Housing Development Authority, which would create 100% permanently affordable housing throughout the state through the use of a public authority and is that is not reliant on for-profit developers or 421A tax abatements. So we wa might want to get behind that if you think that that's something that has some traction and could benefit us. Uh, that might be an answer for creating more affordable housing rather than uh, market rate housing. But what I'm uh, asking a question about is I'm concerned about the demolition of historic properties, especially in Harlem, but it's a citywide problem. And we just lost a building on Convent Avenue this week. Uh, and um, we are, uh, I think, you know, like buildings are being neglected by owners and some of it is intentional and some of it is non-intentional. And the non-intentional is that people can't afford to, uh, pay for uh, maintenance and uh, uh, when they have structural problems or whatever. So we are holding a workshop on April 6th uh, at Friendship Baptist Church for homeowners, low-income homeowners and senior homeowners of historic properties to help them get through the maze of tax credits. And certainly we'll be working with uh, PEG's organization, as well as uh, people from SHIPO, to walk people through it. The problem is the, uh, the complexity of the applications, and I think what we're talking about is helping homeowners with existing properties be able to get tax credits and loans and whatever to address these uh, maintenance issues so that DOB doesn't come in and declare the building a public hazard and knock it down. And that's the problem we're having now. So can you speak on um, this issue and what we might be able to also do other than tax credits? Anybody, go ahead. You know, as, as you know, um, there are several colleagues groups right now in the city trying to um, pressure the Landmarks Commission or work with the Landmarks Commission um, to uh, make sure that they're monitoring um, construction that, that they've approved. Um, we're also going to try to speak to the Department of Buildings shortly. Some of this is, is, is intractable owners. You know, we lost a building on Astor Row, which the Conservancy spent decades um, helping to restore those unique homes. And um, the woman simply refused, you know, couldn't handle the building, uh, refused offers, and ignored uh, DOB um, fines until it, it was too late. And some, some homes are tied up in estates that, that could take forever. Um, but, you know, this is, a, it could be a whole other program. Um, there used to be a group in Albany that raised money and would go in and pay for some repairs to um, elderly or low-income homeowners. Um, and it was, it was more minor repairs than major, but that's something to look that we should all be looking into. I'll just quickly say at LISC we have a, um, a uh, program called the uh, New York City Home Ownership Network. We work with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and Neighborhood Housing Services of New York State. So I will be sure to give you um, that uh, website. Um, but we, retention, uh, as, for, as, lo as well as uh, first-time home ownership, but retention is a big part of that program, and there is some capital available uh, to help support retention efforts. So I'll be sure to. Well, I, I have your email, right? So I'll just I'll send you the link. Quickly. Building, uh, rental building, uh, 
and uh, in, uh, being neglected by the owner, the city brings in a 7A administrator. And we're thinking that we need a program similar to that for uh, landmark property when an owner is neglecting it, that the city bring in, in an administrator to uh, uh, take care of the repairs. Is that something that's viable, Bill? I think it is. I mean, I think all everything should be on the table for because it's a it's affordable for the homeowner. That's what we're all trying to accomplish. We're trying to keep people in their homes. Otherwise, what could come back is the lien program, which we don't want somebody like that to lose their home, which is the other quote unquote alternative, not a good one. So yes, I think it's, we should talk as something to be discussed. Absolutely. One more question here, but we have to end. This woman in the front, go ahead quickly. Yes. We, we can hear you. Go ahead. I'm being told time's Thanks. up. Now time is up. Okay, I'm Kit Garrett with Save Chelsea. First, Gail, thank you for everything that you do. And Peg, before we close out today, would you please tell everybody about your videos because they're absolutely fabulous. My, que <laughs> right. My question is really simple. You have all the city-owned land, and we need more kind of Mitchell Lama kind of buildings. Can somebody talk to us about what's happening with that? Well, uh, I mean, the city-owned land in Manhattan is not much, I have to be honest with you. Mitchell Lama was the best program ever developed in terms of housing, and of course, much of it got bought out either uh, by the rentals or the co-op owners. I'm quite familiar with Mitchell Lama. So I think that, um, again, I hate to keep going back to the state, but the Mitchell Lama is a state program. It would have to come from the state. I guess you'd call it Mitchell Lama 2.0 or Mitchell Lama Light, something that is, we're also just trying to save some of the Mitchell Lama co-ops um, uh, without getting into all the wheat. So we could talk afterwards, but I am, there's not much land in Manhattan and there isn't a, a push to do Mitchell Lama except on the state level, but we could keep talking. Thank you for the great panel. Let's give them a round of applause. And thank you to the conference. Thank you all again so much for coming today. I hope this starts a lot of the, and continues a lot of the conversations that we're, we've been having and we'll be having a lot more programming. HGC is having tours and more conversations, including one on religious institutions coming up. So we hope you'll join us for those over the next few months. Um, again, if you need AA credit, you can sign up by the front door. And we also have our tour starting um, in a little bit and please visit the preservation fair and our organizations before you leave here today but a big round of applause again for all our panelists thank you